on this episode of Mythbusters. It's all about you with viewer special two as we tackle the top five fan favorites. First up, it's a caveman conundrum. I dubbed this J-Man the Barbarian. If you were alive 10,000 years ago, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> then you asked Carrie Grant and Tory to find out if a machine gun can fell a tree. I want to make a withdrawal. Next, the boys take a swipe at a baseball myth you wanted in the spotlight. I've put makeup on Adam before. Then Buster and Tori are unleashed to find out if you can slide to safety with your jeans. These guys are here to make sure I don't fall to my death. And finally, it's a cartoon classic. <laughs> that worked perfectly. Will a road running trail of leaking gunpowder really blow up Wile E. Coyote style? In three, two, one. Who are the Mythbusters? Smells like science. Adam Savage. This is the kind of thing I do on the weekends. <laughs> and Jamie Heineman. Bada bing, bada boom. Between them, more than 30 years of special effects experience. It bleeds. Joining them, Tori Bellici. We do that again? Grant Imahara. Excellent damn work. And Carrie Byron. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. They don't just tell the myths, they put them to the test. Adam and Jamie asked for them, and you guys delivered big time. I am so overwhelmed. We have so many responses to our request for ideas from viewers. Yeah, my inbox is stuffed. I think it's safe to say that we have enough here to get started. Right. Mythbusters viewer special number two. Let's go. All right. And for the first fan theory, one half of the team is getting dressed up. And it's not Jamie. Here we go again. Oh, I like this. I'm trying to get into the mood. Because what we have here is not so much a myth per se as a more like a, a historical conundrum that a fan has asked us to answer. This particular fan is an archaeological professor, and he notes that this kind of arrowhead is the most common archaeological find. And he's wondering why. I mean, if you're a hunter and you need to go get some dinner, are you going to spend all the time to make this? Or are you going to sharpen a stick and just head on out? So the question is, why would they go to all this trouble to make this? Does it really make it a more effective killing tool? Exactly. This prehistory mystery comes courtesy of archaeology professor Todd Suravel. It's a fact that thousands of stone arrowheads are found each and every year. But Doc Todd wants the Mythbusters to find out why. Why did our stony-faced ancestors have a fondness for flint when an easy-to-make sharpened stick may have worked just as well? So where do we start? Well, I think we start and find out how long it takes to make a flint arrowhead as opposed to a sharpened stick. Let's have a race. You should make some flint ones, and I'll sharpen some sticks, and we'll compare production time. Yeah, and when it comes to testing time, we need to both look at their lethality as well as their accuracy, because they're both important. I agree. So uh, if you're ready, time to dust off those flint napping skills, because if I'm right, it's about 70 years since you've done it last. <laughs> and they're off. First up in this archaeology anecdote, Adam and Jamie go head to head in an arrow making time trial. Stickmaker Savage has made a razor sharp point in no time at all. But Jamie's finding fashioning flint is far from easy. Okay. Three and a half minutes. I, I, I can't even come close to competing with that. There's no contest. Jamie's been shafted. But he keeps chipping away, and an hour later, finally finishes. We've just seen that it takes much longer to make a stone arrowhead. Now we need to find out if that makes for better arrows. And to do that, we're going to start with a simple lethality test. We'll make some more flint heads, we'll make some more pointed sticks, and we'll fire them into a ballistics gel dummy from a point blank range. To make sure that both arrow types are fired consistently, we're going to use the automatic archer that we built for the ninja special. So that's the plan. But what does our resident Neanderthal think is going to happen? <laughs> Well, 
well said. So with the predictions in place, it's time to get to the point. All right, you ready? Go for it. Here we go. In three, two, one. Worked like a charm. Totally. <laughs> the sharp stick shot straight as an arrow. But what about the all-important penetration? Wow. Mm -hmm. Eight and a half inches. 8.5 inches ain't bad, but will the flint be flung further? Okay, here goes the arrowhead in three, two, one. Look at that. That is pretty clear. The arrowhead went a good inch farther. There's a glint of flint at the back of the bust and one inch more penetration, confirmed by a bunch more tests. But Jamie spotted a problem. The ballistics medium by itself is good flesh analog, but animals usually have fur and hide and things like that on it. So we're going to run the test again and see whether we get any kind of different results with this on it. Despite the hide slightly hindering both the stick and flint arrows, the results are the same. Uh, actually, they were very close. But is that enough to justify all the effort of making one? This one went in this far, this one went in this far. I mean, <laughs> You're dead either way. Right. However, you know, if you think about the animals that are being hunted, some of them are quite large, and you want a bigger wound. You want it to bleed out faster. So I think the arrowhead makes quite a difference. I mean, if you look here, yeah, look at that. There's the pointy stick wound. It's just a little hole. And there's the arrowhead wound. It's nice and wide. But Jamie isn't impressed. In his mind, the size of the entry wound isn't the issue. In terms of penetration, it was only about 5% difference and yet it took a 1,000% longer to make this one than this one. So it may not just be about lethality, it might also be about accuracy, and that's what we have to test next. Yep, they're leaving no stone unturned for this myth. Nope, we haven't made this up. It's a myth straight from the fan site. For the next viewer myth, a fan wants to know if you can chop down a tree with a machine gun. Oh, just like in the movie Predator, where they mow down a chunk of the jungle. Exactly. Oh my gosh, that's funny you should say that, because every time I go hiking in the forest and I'm just like, can I cut that tree down with a machine gun? Perfect. You're going to find out. Tree lovers, huggers, and hippies beware. Tories all fired up and ready to uproot this myth with some machine gun mayhem. Machine guns are a formidable weapon and have been in use for over a hundred years. Their deadly spray of bullets, lethal on the battlefield, is, or so the fans claim, the ideal tool for tree felling. So how are we gonna test this myth? Because I don't wanna go around destroying trees. Well, why don't we get some trees that have been freshly felled for clearing purposes. We'll create our own artificial forest. That way, no trees will have been killed in the busting of this myth. Well, that solves the tree problem. Now we gotta figure out what kind of machine gun we're gonna use. I think to test this properly, we're gonna need to get a bunch of machine guns and see if any of them will cut down a tree. You know, I think the kind of artillery that we're gonna wanna use to test this myth is something that's not gonna be accessible in California. So I think we're gonna have to go back to that secret location where Jamie and Adam tested shooting fish in a barrel. Ah, the secret location. I hope they allow us back. Who's with me? Come on, everybody. Get your guns. Let's go to the forest. Chop down the trees. Right there Whoa. is the reason our insurance premiums are so high. So it's off for some fun in the Arizona sun. We're going to have some fun. On scene at the secret location, the team need just two ingredients. Machine guns are no problem. But the tree line around here has flat line. So the guys pack their own. We have three freshly cut pine trees. Grant's digging holes right now so that we can stick them up. We're going to fire at them, see if we can cut them down. If they do, it won't be because they've selected saplings. These pine trees are fully two feet in diameter and two tons apiece. And before you can say dead tree stalking, the desert is blooming tree trunks. Among them, our boreal expert Mark Mall has planted an extra challenge. We have three freshly cut pine, but what's the tree at the end? The tree at the end is a, is a native mesquite tree. Is that harder to cut through? Um, why do we have this one? It's about four times as dense as the pine tree, and it's going to give the machine gun a run for its money. Yep, this hardcore hardwood is as tough as timber gets, making it the ultimate challenge for the machine gun. But before either tree faces the firing squad, 
Tori takes us through the arsenal. Now, a machine gun is a very general term, so what we've done is we've chosen three different types to cover a very large range. For our small machine gun, we're gonna go with the Thompson submachine gun. It shoots a 45 caliber round. Uh, this is like your classic gangster machine gun that you see in the 30s. The next, our medium range machine gun, is called the saw. How ironic. It's a squad automatic weapon, and it shoots a 223 fully automatic. This one is gonna be fun to shoot. Finally, for our big one, we're shooting the minigun. And this shoots a 30 caliber round, 3,000 rounds per minute. My money for cutting down a tree is on this bad boy right here. Adam and Jamie have been asked by a fan why our ancient ancestors spent so much time making flint arrowheads, when sharpened sticks might have worked just as well. But the caveman jury is still out, because in the so-called lethality testing, both arrow types were pretty much equal. So what's next? The whole point of this exercise is to find out if there's a point to the manufactured point on an ancient arrow. And we have discovered that the, that the projectile point does cause a lot more tissue damage than just a sharpened piece of wood, which, you know, would make your animal bleed out faster and make you be eating dinner sooner. Now the question is, is one of these more accurate over distance? For that, they set up the Ninja Arrowbot 55 feet from the target. But this time, the target has a tash. <laughs> Where'd you find that picture? <laughs> I dubbed this J-Man the Barbarian. <laughs> With J-Man in place, Adam and Jamie line up for round one. They fire six of the stone-tipped arrows in quick succession. Let's go take a look at those. Okay. So far, so good. The arrowheads all hit the target and got very good grouping. <laughs> and to avoid confusion... If I've marked in green group number one, which are all the arrows that had actual flint arrowheads on them, it still is quite deadly at 50 feet in hitting a large, fleshy target like Mr. Heinemann. Now the question is, will we be able to see any difference with the non-arrowheaded tipped arrows? Sharpened sticks. Fire one. In three, two, one. This time, it's a volley of six sharpened sticks. Let's inspect. And just like in the lethality tests, they refuse to be significantly outperformed by their stony counterparts. Well, we've got one up here that's out by itself. Yeah, one bogey. But the rest are pretty much just as clustered as the arrow-headed arrows. At this distance, it doesn't seem to me to be much of a difference. No. Interesting. Dude, you're looking a little worse for wear here. <laughs> you shot me in the neck, man. <laughs> it oh, it's only a flash one. <laughs> <laughs> I can go on. <laughs> so, in summary, our Stone Age scientists have tried lethality testing. Uh, actually, they were very close. And only got a difference in the size of the entry wound. They tried testing accuracy. Please stop hitting me with arrows. That hurts and got the same result. In terms of performance, the arrows are virtually the same. So how do we answer this Dr. Todd's fan fable? Well, here are the facts. It took more than 10 times longer to make an arrow with an arrowhead on it than it did to make a sharpened stick. And yet, neither of them were any better than the other one as far as accuracy or penetration. Yes, but we did find that the arrow had made a bigger wound. And that means that whatever you're hunting, whether it's a bison or a mammoth or what have you, that bigger wound's gonna mean it bleeds out faster. And that means it's gonna die quicker and you're gonna eat sooner. And in the hunting game, baby, that's everything. And you also have to consider that the, you know, the arrow shafts are made out of wood. And if it's just a sharpened stick, it's gonna rot. And the only thing that would be around for us to look at are these arrow heads. So, we don't really know which there were more of. And here's one more argument in favor of ye olde arrowhead, and that is that this is technology. Back in the day, this puppy was caveman bling. And like any technology, you gotta have the latest and the greatest. Don't oh, you? yeah, that's what brings on the caveman ladies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Chopping down trees is a backbreaking and dangerous job. But could there be a better way? Mythbuster fans want to know if you could replace a saw with a machine gun. But enough shooting the breeze. How about them trees? Okay, so our first weapon of today is the Thompson submachine gun, otherwise known as a Tommy gun. Most people know it as the classic gangster weapon. Al Capone, John Dillinger, Machine Gun Kelly, this was their weapon of choice. So grad hitman Imahara has the tree machine gun myth in his sights. He locks, he loads, and lets loose with a drum full of 45 caliber bullets at 500 rounds a minute. But it's soon clear the handheld automatic is far from ideal. You know what, one thing <coughs> I'm seeing with the machine gun, it's just tough to keep it on target because you, you constantly want to rise up. It yeah. just pushes you like that. It's and gonna be tough to cut, you know, to hit the same spot on the tree. Yes, the kickback is making it tough for Grant to focus his fire. And because the safety team won't let him get any closer, Carrie decides the Tommy gun just won't cut it. Grant just sprayed one of these pine trees with bullets. And it didn't give the cutting effect that I even expected. It just had a few dings here and there. So if in this myth they were talking about a Tommy gun, this myth is totally busted. Which means it's time to up the ante. I want to make a withdrawal. Do you think you can help me? Tori, looking like a gun enthusiast magazine cover, is confident the squad automatic weapon, or the saw, will live up to its name. You know, with this machine gun, I think we have a better chance of cutting down a tree just because uh, these bullets are going to be flying at a lot faster velocity, so they should be cutting through the tree. Um, but it's probably going to take a really long time and a lot of ammo, which is okay with me. So Tori assumes the position. And let's rip. After Grant's experience with a Tommy gun, Tori's using a bipod for increased stability and accuracy. It was great, you had a straight line. Yeah. Tori works away, concentrating his fire in a line across the base of the trunk. But despite unloading over three ammo belts into the wood, there's no sign of timber. You got him all right. I don't think it's going down though. And with one last blast, Tori gives up. But unlike the Tommy gun, the saw bullets did go all the way through the trunk. But the relatively small caliber, 223, meant the damage was limited and the tree stayed standing. But the myth is still alive because Carrie Mad Max Byron is up next. Not so long ago, the team went to the ball game to hit some baseball myths right out of the park. Humid balls, cork bats sliding into base and hitting the hide clean off a ball all made the grade. That's the hit! But the fans say there was one glaring omission. Can you guess what's next? Let me see. Eye black? Good call. Well, eye black's supposed to do what? Make you see better? Yeah, by cutting the glare. Either that or it's supposed to strike the fear into your opponents because it looks like war paint. Well, how are we going to test that? Well, I think we should bring Jess into it, and I think she should put some eye black on us, and it's pretty simple. We go out into the sunlight, and we take an eye test, both with and without eye black on our face. Except we can't know which one we've got on. So for one of us, she'll do eye black, and for the other, she'll do regular makeup. We won't know which one, so the test will be blind. So to speak. Exactly. So outside, Jess positions the eye chart so the guys will face directly into the sun. Close your eyes. Then she launches a smear campaign, putting eye black on Adam. I've put makeup on Adam before. <laughs> when was that? Oh, you know. <laughs> and ordinary makeup on Jamie. Remember, they don't know which substance they've got on their faces. Ooh, it's bright outside. Then they take turns sitting Jess's eye exam. H V Z D S N C V K D O N V C S V D V O H C S R. I think that's the last line. The third to the last is the smallest one I can read. At the end of round one, Adam and Jamie each made just a single mistake. Could you tell what you had under your eyes? Honestly, I could not tell whether I had a light or dark color under my eyes. 
They swap stripes and sit the test a second time. C Z S H N. Is Jamie finding it easier with the eye black on? N C V K D C Z. Is Adam struggling with the glare now that his cheeks no longer bear the sooty swipe? H. Uh, how'd I do on that last one? Well, actually, the results are the same. One wrong letter each. However, I really feel like I can see it better. Please tell me I'm wearing the eye black. No? <laughs> Negative results. I'm guessing that what is down there now is lighter because my eyes feel a little bit more kind of irritated. Is what's on me now a lighter color? Uh, no, actually. I, I, it's black, and it, I think it really complements the beret. Oh. So both feel the test was harder with the eye black on. But because the eye test is so subjective, they decide to remove the human element. They're going to use a fake face with a fake tan. Not entirely awful. And insert a light meter into the eye socket. Here's what's going to happen. This is the uh, eye black testing platform. We've got a professional grade, uh, very sensitive light meter sticking out through her eyeball. I've got uh, professional grade eye black from the sporting goods store. Gonna take a reading with the light on without the eye black and with the eye black and see if there's a difference. With a single light source beaming down on our one-eyed outfielder. It's now settled out at around 3,160 or so. The guys note down the reading, measured in lux, with and without eye black. It's about the same. Yeah. I mean, the difference in a couple of lux, you'd never notice it with your naked eye. So the eye black didn't affect the amount of light bouncing off the um, cheek and into the eyeball. Is that it? Or do you have any other ideas? Don't these guys normally wear baseball caps? Yeah. Let's put one on and see what happens. Then maybe it's about the reflected light, not the direct light. On goes the cap, and without eye black, the light meter hovers around 103 lux. Then, being careful not to move the cap, Adam adds the pigment. It's pretty well stabilized, well below 100, like, you know, 90 thereabouts. That's significant. Yeah. With the cap on, the eye black definitely reduced the amount of reflected light. And let's face it, when did you last see a baseballer without his cap? What do you reckon? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, the eye black tests that we were first doing really seemed to point towards the opposite of conventional wisdom. It seemed like we were about to prove that the eye black makes it worse for you in bright sunlight rather than better. Indeed. But uh, once we threw in the addition of the baseball cap, the change in the total amount of light coming in actually turned it in the other direction. It looks like eye black actually does help, it's, so it's plausible. I would agree. This one is ow, plausible. You, yes, you the viewers, want to know, is it possible to fell a tree with a machine gun? So far, Ballistics Balachi and Hitman Imahara have left their wood standing. Well, Grant, I hate to tell you this, but the tree's still standing. But it ain't over till the fat lady sings. And in this case, the fat lady is the Dylan minigun. Now it's time for the big gun. This is the M134D Gatling gun, otherwise known as the Dylan minigun. It shoots 30 caliber rounds at 3,000 rounds per minute. 3,000 rounds a minute <laughs> breaks down to an incredible 50 per second. <laughs> and whatever it sounds like, <laughs> it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Grant, curious to know how long it'll take to take down the tree, has a stopwatch ready. Okay, we're going hot. Yeah! Carrie primes the gun and lines up her target. In three, two, one. Now that's a machine gun. In a torrential downpour, the spent cartridges pile up around Carrie's feet. And in less than a minute, the tree catches fire and... Forty-five seconds. Wow! Oh my gosh! Dude, you just riddled this thing. Look at it. It's the splinter maker. Oh my goodness! It 
Yeah, it's just like, pfft, there's nothing left structurally. Mmm, smells like campfire. Oh, it smells good. Wow. It smells like destruction. Yep, Carrie has sawn her victim in half, which leaves just one conclusion. Well, I think there's one thing we can definitely say. Cutting down a tree with a machine gun, as long as it's a Dylan Gatling, totally confirmed. Okay, so it can be done, but Tori has a question. I wonder how long it would take to cut this with a chainsaw. So we're just gonna do a little test, see how long it would take for a chainsaw to cut through the same tree. Um, I'd rather use a minigun, but let's try the chainsaw, I'll see how it goes. So it's tradition versus the Mythbusters method, and 45 seconds is the time to beat. Sorry, buddy. That was 45 seconds. I was able to get halfway through the tree with the chainsaw, but the chainsaw didn't cost $60,000. So the cheap and cheerful chainsaw is no match for the minigun. But before the team wander off into the sunset, there's one last challenge, the mesquite. Remember, this tree has four times the density of the pine, making it a much tougher target. But is it tough enough? We're going hot. Three, two. One. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> nice shooting. Oh my god. The minigun is the ultimate tree killer. What was the official time? One minute, eight seconds. A little bit longer than the pine. So, as far as the myth's concerned, even if you have a mesquite tree, and you got a Gatling gun. Confirmed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely confirmed. It's confirmed. Not so long ago, the team tested out some hard-wearing myths surrounding jeans. Grant showed that shrink to fit was busted at the seams. Are we going to have to amputate his legs? I don't think you're going to have to. And Tori got dragged through dirt to show denim didn't catch fire. <laughs> but there's another fabric fabrication the fans want unzipped. OK, here's the myth. Guy's on a ski lift. The chair stops. He panics. So what does he do? He pulls off his jeans, he flips it over the top of the wire, and he sails to safety as if he's on a zip line. Yeah! We definitely have to try that one. A zip line is a cable suspended at an angle with a free-moving pulley. Then all you need to glide through the air with the greatest of ease is a tight grip and good old gravity. But on a stalled ski lift, can you use this notion of motion to escape? Can your denim duds really be used to slide safely back to ground? Let's go try that. Well, hang on. Before we go hitting ski slopes, Let's do a test to see the critical angle at which jeans will slide down the cable. It's a good idea, and we should also first try it out in a very controlled, safe environment. To Tori, a controlled, safe environment is like saying, don't push that button. I'm OK. Here at Trapeze Arts, they've got everything we need, including 75 feet of steel cable similar to the kind used on ski lifts. So we're starting out at a fairly shallow angle of you know, probably five or 10 degrees, but in order to get a really accurate measurement of what the true angle is, we have this. It's a little magnetic base uh, angle finder. Next is a question we're all dying to know the answer to. What's Tori's technique? I'm gonna wrap one pant leg around my wrist, toss the other one over the cable, and then wrap this one around my other wrist and then I'm gonna jump out and slide down the cable. Piece of cake. All right, here we go. Come on, dude, like your life depends on it. Three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, your legs. I hear the pants ripping. Ah! Ah! Nice landing, oh. yeah! So in a real life jeans escape, on a Whoa. ski lift cable at an angle of 10 degrees, you simply wouldn't slide. I kind of tried to move a little bit while I was on the cable, and I could hear stitches snappy. A sound you don't want to hear when there's only that stitch between you and a plummet to death. So what the guys need is more angle on Tori's dangle. Now we've increased our angle to 20 degrees. 
double what the first test had. So with the cable at the maximum incline possible on this rig, will Tori slide or stick? All right, 20 degree angle, new pair of jeans. In three, <laughs> two, <laughs> one. I guess if my life depended on it, it you might take me slide, but some it's a pretty good crawl. This time round, Tori does get further down. I wouldn't fall and die. But remember, this myth is about an effortless glide to freedom, not a jerky bunny hop. And check out the big brain on Grant, because he's got an idea. One thing that we're missing is lubricant. So I was looking it up online. Turns out they use a light oil. Now, we don't have exactly the same thing, but we have something that is the same consistency, castor oil. It's Jamie's shop motto in action. If in doubt, lubricate. But will it be the key to the swift escape described in this viewer-inspired myth? Yeah! I didn't think it was going to happen. I really didn't think it was. Tori made it down. But how did the jeans cope with the friction from the cable? Totally ripped right up the crotch. Yeah, but maybe the waistband would save you. Maybe. I think in real life, Tori would meet his death if he tried to use this method to get down from the ski lift. Those ski lifts are really long. He went down maybe 20 feet before those jeans split in half. I'm not seeing this being the most reasonable way to get rescued from being stuck on the mountain. There's only one way to find out for sure, full scale, on a real ski lift. Here's hoping Tori's denim duds are double stitched. And now for something completely different, starting with a flashback. In the tale of the trailblazers, it's time to burn for science. Adam and Jamie release their inner pyro. Oh, camera, let's put it out. First, they proved that a fire trail couldn't catch up. Don't let your guard down yet and then blow up a car's gas tank. No explosion! Then they wrestled with the idea that you can outrun a trail of gunpowder. Oh, it's still going! They sure had a blast. <laughs> but according to fans, there's one thing they forgot to test. What did we forget in Trailblazers? That was a stunning episode. Well, it's a cartoon thing. Let me set the scenario. You've got a keg of gunpowder. It's got a hole in it. It's leaking. You're walking along, leaving a trail of gunpowder. Somebody sneaks up behind, lights the trail. It catches up with you, blows up the keg, and you get all toasty like they do in the cartoons. I love it. Let's do it. OK. It's a cartoon caper the guys just can't resist. Our animated hero is carrying a powder keg. But unbeknownst to him, it's got a leak. The sneaky villain takes advantage. The sparks travel up the falling powder, and our hero is barbecued cartoon style. To test this fun fable, they'll need a robot, an armored remote control robot with a leaking powder keg attachment. We need a powder delivery system that's safe, so I've decided to use Sparky here. He, his hat goes like so. Uh, this is made from an electric wheelchair base. It's radio controlled, computerized, and do anything that I want. But so that I don't destroy it, I'm gonna build an armor cover for it, uh, just out of steel. And uh, hopefully Sparky won't go away when the gunpowder does. There we have it. It's gonna be like, run, Sparky, run. <laughs> With Sparky dressed to kill, it's time to get this myth up and running. Starting, of course, with some bench tests. Well, the main question I want to answer here is, is really a melding of cartoon and human physics. If a person is carrying a barrel full of black powder with a leak in it, can the black powder leaking out of that barrel leave a line contiguous enough to ignite? That's the question. And after laying down a moving trail, it's time to fire up an answer. Firing in three, two, one. There you go. That's fine. I think that's good. <laughs> yes, the trail was continuous enough to let the flame burn along its length. So what's next? Now I feel like I know it would travel along the line, but I want to know if it will climb that line up into the keg. 
So I'd like to walk down halfway down the line, same as I did before, but park it, get out, light it, and see if it <laughs> blows up the cone. <laughs> that worked perfectly! Mythbusters and perfection. Not words you often hear in association. That was very satisfying. <laughs> that was perfect. It was like, <sighs> boom. Little pop at the end there. Tells me what I need to know. And what he needs to know is it's time to hit the bomb range with Sparky and a truckload of gunpowder. If you're stuck on a stalled ski lift, is it possible to use your jeans to zip line down to terra firma? Practicing this alpine escape on a circus high wire, Tori glided to the ground. Now, to test this on a real mountain, but before leaving, a mysterious package has arrived at M7. I have a surprise for you. A dead body! This is not a coffin. Oh. This is the new buster. No way! Oh, thank God, I'm so sick of putting him back together. Oh, oh that's cute. How cute is that? They uh, gave him coveralls with Buster's name on it. Oh, He's Buster now. That's adorable. Let's take a moment to salute our former Buster's dedication. Come on, Buster! Tireless work ethic and positive attitude. Dang, he hit hard. Thanks a bunch, buddy. It's time for a well-earned retirement. That was cool! Being a former crash test dummy, Buster 2.0 is a well-qualified replacement, so he's being put straight to work. Tori is prepping him to take the first zip line plunge. Before any of us try it, we're gonna let Buster try it first so we can see how dangerous it is. Tori carefully replaces Buster's hands with metal clamps tests his jeans grappling grip. Looks like it's gonna hold on to me. And loads him into the van. Leaving Carrie at home to rest her sore leg, the guys head for the hills. It's Bigfoot, it's confirmed. That's not the myth we're busting, relax. The Sierra at Tahoe Resort is their destination. And despite knowing Buster will be going first, Tori's a little nervous. That's a lot steeper than I thought it was gonna be. Yep, and we're doing it all the way from the top. When we were at Trapeze Arts, we found that an angle of 20 degrees was just enough to start sliding down the line with a pair of jeans when the line was greased. Oh! Here at Sierra Tahoe, they have the same consistency grease. Just to hedge our bets, we found a section of line close to the top that's at 25 degrees. If I get quiet, don't take it personally. I'm not mad, I'm just freaking out. <laughs> Try and avoid the rocks, yeah. At the top, Chief Rigger Lawrence and his crew are putting together a safety system of ropes and pulleys. <laughs> These guys are here to make sure I don't fall to my death. Tori and Grant strap on their harnesses, secure themselves to the chair, hoist in Buster, and head downhill. <laughs> are we nuts or what? Oh my god. So what's the denim divination? The best case scenario for Buster is that he and his jeans will take a very quick ride down the line, slam into the rollers at the end. And the worst case scenario is that he will rip through his jeans and probably plummet to his doom. <laughs> when they reach the 25 degree mark, they sling over the jeans and secure them to Buster's clamp hands. Buster is ready to go. All we need to do is unhook him from the chair and release this ratchet strap. It's a long journey to the bottom, Buster. Don't forget to write. Here we go. Dropping Buster, Gene Smith, test one. In three, two, one, go. <laughs> Sit down there. <laughs> Nothing really happened. We pushed him off and he just stuck there. Even though Buster is only about 10 pounds lighter than Tori, his weight couldn't overcome the friction of the jeans on the cable, and he simply stuck on the line. <laughs> what do we do now? How about help him down? Three. Ah! Oh! Although Buster never lost his grip, he's a bit of a dummy, 
and couldn't follow Tory's lead in creating his own momentum. Good job, buddy. Way to take one for the team. Question is, can Tory do any better? You know, I don't know if I should have seen that. The fans have a theory that if you pull off your jeans, you can pull off a daring denim escape. But Tori and Grant found that if you try to fly down a ski lift cable by the seat of your pants, the friction can fix you in place. Go! <laughs> but they may have a way to fight it. Buster is only a dummy. He can't move himself along. But if you're a real person up there in that situation, if your jeans didn't start to slide immediately, you'd be like, oh, OK, I've got to do something and move yourself along. Cue Tori for an attempted slide down the ski lift in hot pants. Well, they will be after all the friction. So let's flip the jeans over and try to fly. In three, two, one. Get that weight on those jeans. Nice, nice. Very nice, but it's not easy. My hands started cramping up because I was holding onto the jeans so tight. But then I had to lift my weight off the jeans so that I could shimmy down the cable. And then my arms started getting tired. Our little dungarees clad flying squirrel is plum tuckered out. And not only that, stuck. I can't, I'm stuck. See that? Okay, I see it. I'm let go. Ugh. It's so much work trying to get down the cable that it's like, it just doesn't seem like a great way to get down. Plus, the myth implies your jeans are an effective substitute for a zip line, and that's clearly not the case. For me, when I think about a zip wire, it's like, whoa, you know, all the way down. This was not like that. This was like, uh, 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 uh. The jeans themselves actually starting to roll up as they grab onto the cable. There's way too much friction in the system to be able to slide. So guys, how'd it go? Uh, it was a little disappointing, and it was nothing like we imagined. You know, you picture going down a zip line, it took a lot more work than that. The jeans kept sticking to the cable. Yeah, using your clothing to escape a ski lift, bad idea. Either the clothing is gonna rip, or your arms are gonna give out. So zipline jeans escape, busted. 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 Jamie and Adam are tackling a tall tale of cartoon physics. Can a leaking trail of burning gunpowder catch up and blow up the moving powder keg? To find out, our animated duo are back at the Alameda bomb disposal range. We've come back to the bomb range. We're going to do the same setup as we did before, plywood laid down for the gunpowder to go on, except this time, the difference is Sparky will be going full tilt with gunpowder leaking from his barrel. The question we wanted to answer is, will the lit trail catch up with him? It's the viewer special. The fans ask for it, and that's what we're going to deliver. And speaking of Sparky, he's just raring to go. Sparky is radio controlled. I'm going to be down that way, looking straight down the line that Sparky's gonna be traveling. And when we're all set and good to go, we're gonna pull the plug out of the barrel, out comes the powder, off goes Sparky, and hopefully I can keep him ahead of the powder, because if I don't, he's blowing up. Jamie's making it all sound so easy, but Adam's not convinced. This is tough, because this is not a myth where we're working from an actual case that we've read about or a story someone's told us. This is like cartoon physics. So, of course, we're going to run into trouble between cartoon physics view of the world and the real world. Uh, and in the real world, we've got an outdoor thing. It's the only place we can do this experiment with black powder. And, of course, outdoors, there's going to be a breeze. With a tumbling trail of powder vulnerable to the wind, the guys carry out the final prep with one eye on the weather. Sparky's barrel is loaded with two pounds of gunpowder, and Adam rigs a remote ignition system to spark the powder trail to life. There you go. This is it. Jamie's ready with Sparky's remote controls. I'm on. So Adam pulls the plug on the powder keg. But there's a problem. OK, it's not leaking. I'm going to make it leak, OK? OK. Standing by. With the gunpowder failing to fall out, Adam employs powder delivery device number two. 
And with that sorted, it's take two. Okay, go. Jamie directs Sparky along the track, trailing his deadly trail. Then Adam lights her up. In three, two, one. But oh! <laughs> there's another problem. The sparks caught up with Sparky, but didn't travel up the falling powder and into the keg. Adam and Jamie's solution is to drill a larger hole for a more substantial leak. I'm on. But once again, our Big Bang junkies don't get no satisfaction. It didn't go. That sucker just wants to clog. Yep, despite several more attempts, either the powder doesn't want to fall freely or stay lit all the way to the intended target. Uh, wait. And although Adam's annoyed, he's adamant they can get this right. I don't think this is disproving the myth or saying that it's not possible. I don't think we're hitting our mark, and I'm not ready to call it until I feel like we have. What Adam and Jamie need is an ingenious last-minute plan to keep the powder flowing freely. The only thing I can think to do is put a shaker on it. <laughs> and the only shaker I have is right here. That's really a shame to make this go away, but... It's, it's a nice drill. The problem is, is gunpowder is not leaking out of our keg. It keeps on clogging, and every time we tap it, then it comes out. So positing that someone who's holding onto a keg while running is actually imparting some vibration to it, and this is the vibration I'm talking about. Hopefully this will get this thing to drop powder regularly and allow us to blow it to smithereens. It's the last chance for this viewer myth. Now or never. This is No Drill. Here we go. <laughs> yeah! That worked! <laughs> well, uh, Sparky looks like he's... Let me see if he's still alive. Hey! <laughs> Success! The gunpowder trail worked. It caught up, it traveled up the leak, and it exploded the barrel. And what's more, Sparky and the drill have survived intact. <laughs> Sparky survived, but this isn't about Sparky. This is about what if you were carrying that barrel? And I'm here to tell you, you'd be dead. Even though these explosions were incredibly small, they were some of my favorite ones we've ever done on the show. Something about seeing the line of the fuse going towards the barrel of explosive stuff satisfies me on a deep five-year-old level. <laughs> A favorite explosion and a viewer myth confirmed. All in all, a good day's work. Oh, there, boy. <laughs> okay, I can do some formation work if you'd like to. <laughs>